Welcome to Apaga University. I'm Inga. And I'm Julie. We are two entrepreneurs who have built an in-home care business from the ground up, guided every step of the way by God's care and fueled by agape love. 16 years later and over 100 podcast episodes already under our belts, we invite you to continue on this journey with us as we share stories that resonate, insights that inspire, and practical guidance that empowers you to face any obstacle along this path. Whether you're a professional caregiver, a family member, or are simply curious about what your steps will be when you need them, you have come to the right place. Oh, hey, and while you're here, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And after that, make sure you send this to a friend. Yes, do it. All right, we'll quit fooling around and get to it. Let's go. Class is in session. Hello, Sunshines, and hello, Julie. Hi, Inga. How are you? I am well-dressed. Thank you. You are, too. I wanted to beat you to it. You got <laughs> you got your little <laughs> spectacle taken care of? <sighs> you know. What happened? Did you have a spill? No, it just, evidently, the shirt didn't wash well. And so I had oh. a spot, and everybody had to comment on the spot. So I had to make sure the spot. I thought I gave really solid advice to just tuck your boobs under the table. <laughs> no? I, it's. It's a posture. You have to have good posture. And oh. if I had to do that kind of court, uh, uh, calisthenics, finagling, <laughs> it would not be good posture. Perfect. So it's instead, you covered yourself up with a sweater. Quit looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you feeling self conscious? No, not at all. Is it wrong that I brought to attention? No. Anywho, what is going on? Why? We're like just out of control. <sighs> Because life is hard, and so we're trying to lighten it up just as go. She got a tick? A little bit. <laughs> I really, you guys, I just discovered the Chick-fil-A, the actual sandwich. Because I've all, always just gotten the um That's what nugs. they're famous for, you weirdo. Well, I thought it was the nugs. So I've only gotten the nugs or like So this whole dang time. Yes. You've and- never had the sandwich. You have the sandwich, and it has changed your life. Absolutely. I've had one every single day since I, I discovered it. I don't even know who you it. are. And now- it's I'm hungry for one, <laughs> but I have responsibilities, sponsorabilities <laughs> of recording a podcast. And all I can think about is the Chick-fil-A sandwich. That will be your reward. Will it? So okay. pull it together, lady. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if I talk fast, it's because you know that I'm hungry. She's hangry. That too. <laughs> all right. Well, um, anyway... Should we just start with a verse? I think we should. Okay, good. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Mm-hmm. And it says, You should know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit that you receive from God and that lives in you. You don't own yourselves. God paid a very high price to make you his. Mm-hmm. So honor God with your body by putting in a Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. It it kind of um, talks to each one of us about the body as a temple thing, right? Yes. Yeah. We should be better to ourselves. That is for darn sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that was very profound. Well, I do. Are we fading? No. What I'm thinking <laughs> of is the uh, a past episode just recently. We were talking about, however, we are still perfect in God's eyes. Yes, this is true. There. We are, but I think we just need to, to be kind to ourselves and, and treat our bodies well. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 And, um, the reason we're talking about that is we are actually talking about a medication today. That's, uh, got its pros and its cons and the people that like it, the people that don't. Yes. And so I was just generally thinking about, um, what we do to our bodies Yes. and, and we should be taking care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where that came from. Perfect. Mm-hmm. What'd you bring for a good news story? Well, actually, thank you, Inga. <laughs> you brought it for me. Uh, special delivery. When there's a will, there's a way. We need a wheelchair, the familiar voice on the telephone told me. Not an unusual request because it was a retired physician um, that was living his dream as a volunteer over in a third world world country. Um, even in my work, he had called me often over the past years with similar requests. Uh, this wheelchair is for an older man with no feet and legs, and it needs plenty of room in the back in the seat. And as the executive director of association of more than 100 churches, I pass requests like this on to individuals and groups um, who can help. So in this case, um, 
the woman called the chairman of our ministry that supplies medical equipment. So then they find it, but then they're like, how in the heck are we going to get it to this person? Um, so um, I will be taking this chair with me when our group goes to Siberia. I didn't want to appear skeptical, um, question his enthusiasm for the need of this uh, wheelchair, or sound like a Downey Thomas. So I said, great, we'll be praying for you and your, your church group on this trip to Siberia. And privately, I wondered, how in the world are they going to get that wheelchair from here to there in such a remote destination? Um, and since this person had traveled that part of the world, they knew all of the obstacles uh, to get there. Uh, and I actually even read tape of taking unusual items through customs. Um, their ingenious plan was soon revealed to me. One of the members of the volunteer group was pregnant. Um, so basically what they said is the doctor wrote a prescription for the airline and customs officials explaining that the condition of the expectant mother required her to ride in a wheelchair through the airports between connecting flights, which of course would necessitate her having the wheelchair aboard all of the flights. All the airlines were very cooperative in meeting the special needs of this expectant mother as she conscientiously followed doctor's orders in all ways to Siberia. No one questioned the radiant and rested expectant mother and getting through her customs was an absolute breeze. <laughs> Um, upon re arriving in Siberia, they traveled to the remote village that was uh, the location of their work assignment. Just to be on the safe side, all of the while, the expectant mother took her dutiful place in the wheelchair. As they approached the place where they knew the older gentleman would be sitting on the ground begging for food, um, excited anticipation filled each member of the group. The expectant mother maneuvered herself up beside him and stepped energetically away from the wheelchair. Several men picked up the double amputee and placed him in the specialty prepared uh, wheelchair with a very little instruction. The overwhelmed, overwhelmed man soon was proudly navigating the wheelchair everywhere. His sense of independence and dignity soaring. Now he was as radiant as the wheelchair's prior occupant. <laughs> when people ask the Siberian gentleman how he got his wheelchair, he replies with a smile, special delivery. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. That is adorable. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. Man, we are so lucky. In America. Oh, yeah. With the things that we have and we don't have to fight to get. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And I think that one came from the chicken soup for the golden soul. Okay. I love yeah. it. And then I have a very thought-provoking video that oh, I'm not boy. sure if you've seen it um, or not. But anyone who's been here obviously knows that we quote scripture a lot. And so we are believers. And then I saw this video and I was like, man, I feel like I want to share this. So here we go. Red Star and dropping absolute bombs. And people say, yes, what's the difference? You know, well, the Bible's just another book. No, first off, that's wrong. The Bible's not a book. The Bible's six of six books. Forty different people wrote it. Over 1,500 years. There's never been a book like that in history. Ever. Does that make it the Word of God? No. It just means it's worth considering. Because there's never been a book like this. It gives you some reason to consider it over the others. Well, how about history? For hundreds of years, archaeology has used the Old Testament and New to find buildings, to find people, to find civilizations, to find kings that didn't exist or they didn't think they did. And suddenly the Bible said they're there and they dug it up and there it was. Does that make it the Word of God? No. It means it's historically accurate. Real people really existed and really wrote down what they saw. It's worth considering. And then they said, we're going to have God show up. And lots of people said that. Lots of religions say it. Don't worry, we'll prove it as a rational God would do. I will do prophecies. I will show that I'm not trapped in linear time, that I can see beyond where you are. I will give prophecies to tell you what the guy, when I show up and God appears on earth to reveal himself, I'll show you what he's going to look like. Over 300 prophecies. And then a man showed up one day named Jesus. And he said, I'm that guy. And he fulfilled all 300 prophecies. That's impossible. People could say, well, yes, uh, they just wrote it afterwards and filled it all in. But we know that the first Greek translation of the Old Testament was done 250 years before Jesus was born. So how could they possibly know that he'd be born in Bethlehem? How could they possibly know he was going to be crucified when crucifixions didn't even exist as a capital punishment yet? How could they know that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver 250 years before there was a Jesus? Does it make it the word of God? No, but it's starting to get close. And then Jesus said he would fulfill these things and did miraculous things to prove I'm not just a guy talking like everybody else. Look what I've done. And some people believe and some didn't. That's how humans are. And then he said this, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to die. And I'm going to come back to life. 
Nobody ever done that. And he died. And all those who were with him, three years, ran in fear, as would all of us. And they ran away and they said, I guess it, we were wrong. And then something happened. Something happened that made all of these guys come back and be willing to be martyred for this belief system, except for one. Of course, he was, John was sent off, but everybody died a martyr's death. What was it for? Because they thought they were going to get rich. There was no riches here. There was no riches. The Roman government hated them. They wanted them destroyed. They'd use them as, as people that could be eaten alive by animals for sports and entertainment. You were kicked out of your culture. The Jews weren't going to take you in. So there was no value there. There was nothing good here. There was nothing here to gain. And they all still died for what? Because they found a new religion? No, for one reason. They said this. I saw him die. And I saw him come back. Isn't that crazy? That's <laughs> good. Yeah, I just thought that was very thought-provoking. Yeah. Yeah, he's actually uh, quite a speaker. He's got a lot of energy, and he's very passionate about the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, I'll have to get that uh, link from you. Yep, absolutely. Can yeah. do. Butterloo. Good it. Good it good. If you have a story, if you have a verse, if you have anything you'd like to share with us, please email those. You can do that to inga at apagahomecare.com or julie at apagahomecare.com. Yes. Today we're talking about morphine. Morphine. Why don't you tell us? Well, we, um, <clears throat> in our business, we do everything from companionship to end of life. Um, with end of life comes medications to help us with whatever it may be that we're dealing with at the end of life. And um, quite often um, the go-to medication is morphine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think about morphine as it's going to kill them. Right. Uh, I felt like it was really important to talk about morphine as the medication, how it um, is used in, in more ways than just for hospice care. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, you know, give a couple of examples of people that use morphine for other things and, and, it really was an eye opener to me because I'll be honest with you. So way back when uh, Callie was in seventh grade, mm -hmm. um, she had a gastroparesis mm -hmm. and uh, basically her stomach just froze. She couldn't take anything down and it was, it was scary. Um, and I was very frustrated uh, because I couldn't get anybody locally to come up with a diagnosis of any sort. So at one point when this happened and she was having a, an acute uh, problem with it, I just literally got her in my vehicle and drove to Spokane because they have a peds, um, pediatric emergency room. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, I said, um, this is what's going on with my kid. Mm -hmm. Immediately they had the diagnosis on it mm -hmm. and they said, okay, we're going to give her morphine. And I'm like, you're going to give her what? Mm. And I was like, cause I really thought morphine was for when you are going to pass. Right. But that was a standard protocol. And I'm just like, I don't know very much about this medication. Well, I think there is such a stigma that comes along with it. Because exactly. You, and especially with what we do, mm -hmm. it's always morphine at end of life, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. and I've heard it over many, many, many people that I'm um, talking about, you know, increased morphine will essentially kill somebody. Uh -huh. And yeah, I think that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes, that's but exactly. just misconceptions, stigmas, and... And, and the, the benefits of, of this um, and why you're not supposed to be scared of it because it is a tool. Right, right, right. And, and that's the, the goal here. Yeah. So, um, so basically, morphine is an opioid medicine that is prescribed for pain relief, um, and it's not without controversy sure. like we're saying. When there are strong concerns about substance abuse and addiction to the narcotic, people often wonder things like, is it safe to take morphine or how long does uh, morphine typically stay in your system? If you were to talk to a hospice care worker, you're probably going to hear that this powerful pain relief medication, um, that it also gets a bad rap, like mm -hmm. you were saying, in their world. One of the common concerns is if giving morphine to your dying loved one actually brings about their death sooner. Um, so basically... 
it's all about proper dosage and timeliness of administration. Mm -hmm. Um, But giving the right amount of morphine to someone who's having trouble breathing might actually help them breathe easier. Mm -hmm. Um, For someone with breathing difficulty brought on by conditions like a terminal lung disease, um, um, it can feel like you're drowning in gasping for air. Mm-hmm. So morphine opens the blood vessels, allowing more blood circulation within the respiratory system. This makes it easier for the lungs to get the bad gases out and the good gases in. The patient becomes calm and their breathing slows down. Mm-hmm. They're not having to spend their energy on just breathing. For me, what's interesting is um, what what always comes to my mind when I think about morphine is actually comfort. Uh-huh. Just exactly. make, helping to make someone comfortable, mm-hmm. whatever it is that they're going through, mm-hmm. whatever pain level, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, terminal mm-hmm. disease. And that's what you have to accept mm-hmm. is, is that, but this, why this education I felt was so important mm-hmm. because people just freak out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And morphine as a, as like morphine, it does not speed up death. Right. So it's important to know that now used incorrectly. <laughs> or overdosed. Yes. Um, different story. But when you're when it's being used through like a hospice agency or prescribed and taken as the doctor prescribes you to take it, mm-hmm. it's not going to speed up death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, what we're trying to do with this medication, and there are other medications, but morphine is the one we're focusing on. Mm-hmm. Um, it does improve the end of life experience for someone mainly because it blocks pain signals mm-hmm. and helps with a lot of distressing sensations. Um, someone might be feeling at the final moments before death, like shortness of breath, pain, restlessness, and agitation. Mm -hmm. We've seen all of those things. Yes. Yeah. So basically you, um, you have to start this medication. You have to then sustain it and then as needed, increase it for wherever the person is in the dying process. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does come with its own side effects, um, but every medication does. Um, so should you be concerned about administrating the uh, morphine? But they say ultimately no. Um, no one can answer that question but you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hospice workers urge loved ones to be correctly informed of the intricacies of why morphine is given in the first place and how it is done in a professional setting. Mm-hmm. Um Pain is part of the dying process, and if pain medication such as morphine can relieve some of the suffering, it might be one of the kindest things you can do for your loved one. Mm-hmm. You might be giving them a a little more independence to be able to eat and drink without discomfort, sleep better, and even maintain more cognitive capabilities, ask questions from healthcare professionals. Sometimes having the right knowledge can um, help you with your fears. Mm -hmm. So uh, the patient is dying of other causes, and morphine only softens the symptoms of the last moments of life. And uh, one of the effects of morphine uh, called respiratory depression does not occur with small controlled doses of short acting opioids, especially when under the supervision of a healthcare right. professional. Right. And they're very, I mean, it's a controlled substance. Yeah. So it's not like um, anyone is going to be given just free reign on this. Absolutely not. Actually, part of the reason for this podcast as well is we did have a scenario mm-hmm. a while ago mm-hmm. where um, the the family was just knew that it was time for dad to go. Mm-hmm. And um, they had asked for a an, an life-ending dose. <laughs> and it brought up a lot right. of red flags. The family was not trying to kill him. They were trying to just have him not suffer anymore. And so those questions sparked a lot of controversy. Right. And um, and it was very interesting where then uh, the whole topic of um, right to die mm-hmm. came up. And Montana is not that... And so, man, it can cause a lot of uh, turmoil. Yes, at a very uh, time when you shouldn't have any more turmoil. But this is they they um, were told and just absolutely we will not increase. Right, the body is going to do what the body is going to do. We'll keep him comfortable within what's yeah, reasonable. But we cannot but and will not right give him one large dose for right. him to be gone now. <laughs> I don't know. That was a tough one. Very, very. Because very. there was a lot of emotions on each side and everybody kind of judged each other for a bit there because you kind of look at each other like, what is happening? But the professionals had to keep a- alongside their, you know, the requirements of their job. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, the that's... laws of the, the state. Yes. Ugh. Because used incorrectly. 
Yes, but used correctly, mm-hmm. there's nothing to fear yeah. from it. But yeah. Yeah. Th- that's with anything in life. If you don't, oh, if you don't follow the instructions, you could get yourself in trouble. But so this is really dumb, really dumb. Morphine, and because I've always just thought of it as the hospice mm-hmm. use until I had to have it used on my daughter. Mm-hmm. But I've always heard of MS Cotton, and that's morphine. That's the generic name for it. What? So I have been around this medication always. Um, and it also goes by a, a different name. Cadian and MS Cotton are the brand names. The generic name is actually morphine, so I got it backwards there. But you've heard of MS Cotton? Yeah. I did not know that it was morphine. Interesting. Yeah. Neither did I. Yeah. So what is morphine? Well, basically, it's just the prescription medicine that's used to treat uh, moderate to severe pain. Mm -hmm. And it is an opioid, so it's important that people know that. Yeah. But they have, like, extended release forms of morphine that are for around-the-clock treatment of moderate to severe pain in adults. And extended release tablets and capsules should not be used to treat pain that can be controlled by medication um, that is taken, like, as needed. I mean, it, it is important. When when our friend's son was in that very bad car accident, I feel like maybe he had a a because I know a lot of times in the hospital a morphine drip. There's like a morphine drip, and uh-huh. basically when the pain starts to get really out of control, they can push the button and it gives a little you know whatever boost. that boost of it is. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, interesting. It, it it it's it's pain control. Yeah, yeah, for whatever ails you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So the biggest thing is it is a narcotic. Mm -hmm. It's an opioid. And we all know that opioid is a scary word for the whole world. Because it can be addictive. And it... We have addictive personalities everywhere, <laughs> everywhere in the world. Yep. And, and so that is where this also becomes that scary word. Yeah. So side effects of morphine and things where you would need to consider getting a, emergency medical help if you're having a, like a, an allergic reaction, hives, difficulty breathing, swelling in your face, your lips, your tongue, or your throat. Um, opioid medicine can actually slow down or stop your breathing and death can occur, mm-hmm. especially if you drink alcohol and use other drugs that cause drowsiness or slow breathing. Mm. Um, so basically again, it's used correctly. It's not a problem, but anything in life, if we use it incorrectly can potentially cause a problem. (laughs) So some of the serious side effects and when to call your doctor, slow heart rate, weak pulse, fainting, a slowing breath or a breath that stops, Mm -hmm. uh, chest pain, faster pounding heartbeats, extreme drowsiness, or feeling like you might pass out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then basically, decreased adrenal gland hormones that basically cause nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, loss of appetite, feeling tired or lightheaded, muscle or joint pain, skin discoloration, craving salty foods, Mm -hmm. and serious breathing problems may um, be more likely in older adults and people who are debilitated or have other chronic breathing disorders. But Mm -hmm. it is, I mean, it's any medication that you're going to take, you need to pay attention for potential side effects. Yeah. Yeah, so related or similar drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, so this just is freaking me out because it's out there way more than I was even aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, gabapentin, you know, I hear about that a lot. Yep. Um, the acetaminophen. Acetaminophen. I knew it was going to be a problem. <laughs> Tramadol, uh, naproxen, which is like your Aleve, mm-hmm. Tylenol, and oxycodone. Mm-hmm. So uh, right here in the big capital letters and and in bold print misuse of opiate mis- medication can cause addiction overdose or death mm-hmm. and fatal side effects can occur if you use morphine with alcohol or other drugs that cause drowsiness or slow your breathing yeah so i mean it's I, it's not intended to scare people it's just intended to give you information mm-hmm. on again used correctly mm-hmm. and then paying attention if you have some type of a side effect i would think that it's probably not a medication that you want to take for the first time if you're by yourself <laughs> exactly good point uh, and i got to be honest if if i had something going on and and they gave me um, MS cotton mm-hmm. i i think i would deny it and say what else do you got in your right. little uh, bag of potions there i uh, Just historically have not, my stomach does not settle well with any type of a a narcotic Mm -hmm. drug, which is great Mm -hmm. because uh, Tylenol and Advil, aspirin actually. Aspirin because there's no school like the old school, right? (laughs) 
that is the best one. Yeah. For me. Anyway. Yeah. Well, but- and everybody um, will uh, be different. I had one time somebody um, gave me some medication and I took one and in within 20 minutes I was like gone. <laughs> I had to sleep the rest of the day to get it out. <laughs> NyQuil? Was it NyQuil? No, <laughs> it was <Just> not. <laughs> but um, anyway, I just realized that I had a very low susceptibility to that medication. Right. So to be very cautious with it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, of course, just like any meds, if you're pregnant or, or think you are, don't take it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the way that we help um, with the, the medications um, in a hospice situation is usually they give the liquid morphine. Mm-hmm. And then um, the family will give that at the allowed time. It's right. just in a syringe mm-hmm. that's put into the mouth mm-hmm. and it just absorbs really quickly. Um, and then um, when we have some in hospice, the hospice um, agency becomes our medical director. And what happens is if there's any agitation or there's um, labored breathing, um, anything that they're in pain, we call them and they'll tell us if we need to do a different medication or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But they're right there with you every step Mm -hmm. of the way. Yes. So you're not just free willy out there just doing what you're doing. Definitely comes from someone smarter than us. Yeah. When it comes to that. (laughs) Yeah. So um, drinking alcohol is a big bad Mm -hmm. no-no. And then other drugs that will affect morphine. and some a lot, a lot of them are just dangerous when you're using an opioid, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, medications for allergies, cough. You basically, if you're getting a medication, your doctor better know what else you're on, right? And you need to be honest, people. <laughs> you need to be honest about Even what over the counter stuff. Yes, or herbs, herbs and herbs, herbs and herbs. <laughs> yep. Um, what are you taking um, uh, that you think is natural mm-hmm. that may And I would imagine that basically also, you know, when you go to the pharmacy and you get your first time you have ever taken a medication, they're going to pull you aside and Mm -hmm. talk to you about that. So yeah, they always ask, do you need, do you have any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Making sure that, that everybody is aware of everything that you're taking because you don't want to get into a bad situation. Right. Right. Um, What we're going to do is give an example about a a woman that um, had to help um, give medications to her father when mm-hmm. he was on hospice and kind of the emotional stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically what they're trying to talk about is the miscommun- uh, misconceptions about morphine. Mm-hmm. Sandra was distraught. In addition to experiencing grief following her father's death, she was haunted by fears that she had killed him by agreeing to use morphine to control his pain near the end of his life. He never woke up after we started the morphine. It was only a couple of days until he died. Morphine is a standard and often the best medication for keeping terminally ill patients comfortable. Uh, It works on receptors in the body to reduce pain and shortness of breath, which are two of the most common symptoms encountered at the end of life. Having a drug available to treat those symptoms is critical to keep the individual comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, It has many advantages for the terminally ill. In addition to its effectiveness and reliability, it can be administered in many ways. Mm -hmm. A tablet, liquid, or injection it is relatively fast onset of delivery, and doses can start low and be adjusted in small increments. Um, research is clear that when norphine, morphine is used under proper medical guidance, um, such that as the hospice team, mm-hmm. it doesn't cause or hasten death. Ultimately, Sandra's um, fears were very, very common. Um, they said that they often meet patients and family members who associate morphine with the, uh, the death. Mm-hmm. or making the death happen sooner. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a pervasive problem. And um, one reason for the fear is it's the association of morphine with the opioid epidemic. Mm-hmm. And so ongoing media attention about high rates of addiction and opiate, opioid-related deaths gets pulled into what people's perception of the medication does when it's being used correctly. Well, and I would think that... Um, it- in an end of life situation, you know, if someone is, you know, actively somewhat distressed or you're seeing them 
moving, breathing, whatever, and then they get this morphine dose and then they just kind of stop with all of that behavior. It could maybe have the tendency to freak you out like, oh my God, what have I done? Right. But I think changing that point of view and saying, no, I've just provided comfort for this person. Exactly. So they're no longer struggling. Exactly. I mean, I want, I want my people, I want my loved ones to be comfortable when yeah. that time in life comes. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's a terrible thing. And uh, some people, when they're taking care of their loved one, like you're talking, they're the ones administering mm -hmm. the medication because hospice can't be there every time sure. a dose needs to be given. So they're the ones that take on all of the emotions of then when that person passes. So the biggest thing I think about is, do I use morphine to ease my loved one's suffering despite fear that it could cause harm? Do I refuse morphine knowing my loved one's physical suffering may not be adequately el eliminated? So um, also distress in this kind of thought, it can be intensified by personal or cultural mm -hmm. beliefs. For example, a caregiver who believes that God cares those who are generally prayful may view using morphine as a lack of trust in God. Boy, that brings up a lot of thoughts, doesn't it? Yep. Um, and which might undermine hope for a miracle. Uh, those who believe this, um, it is their responsibility to encourage a life partner or to remain hopeful may uh, see using morphine as giving up on or even betraying the patient. Hmm. Oh boy. A common origin of the belief that morphine causes death in terminally ill patients is that it's often used in the last days and hours of life. Um, they don't allow you to use it just willy nilly. It's very well thought out mm -hmm. based on the progression of the disease mm -hmm. that the person is passing with. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it can be scheduled every couple of hours. Um, but, um, that's where the timeline really gets fuzzy. Well, right. And like, if you're on hospice, there's a reason that you're on hospice. Yeah. And so it's not as though there's a lot of hope that this particular situation or diagnosis or whatever you're going through is going to turn around. Now, that being said, people do graduate off of hospice, but um, it is not because of the morphine that someone is, their life is ending. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, said that patients are referred to hospice late in their illnesses. Um, so that's once again, exactly what you're saying. Um, we only have, we have many patients who are only on hospice for a couple of days before they pass. Mm -hmm. Um, this may have been in, they may have been in pain and discomfort for weeks. Um, but I just had a home visit yesterday and I talked to a family. I said, is your dad on hospice? Because what they said is his diagnosis is in stage. Mm. And I was like, have you entertained the thought of hospice? Mm. And I, I, I love hospice. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful program. It's another tool for the family to have in their back pocket. Mm -hmm. Nursing is there. A chaplain is available. Social work. All of it is there for you. So many people think that I'm putting my my person on hospice and that means they're going to die it's a death sentence right now and yeah. we have had people we've talked about this where people are graduated off of it but what happened is the home visit was yesterday and then today they were actually going to see his primary care physician and I said talk to your siblings tonight and you guys decide if it is time which I believe it is for him to be on this program I said, it's a personal decision for you, but I want you to understand that you, um, you can benefit mm -hmm. from this program. The problem is people do not get on the program soon enough because there is not anybody that's, um, been, that just starts hospice. So they're immediately going to start giving you morphine, right? It's the progression of the decline, right. you know, of the, uh, the, the disease, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, based on what the family told me, they were already going through several declines. Mm -hmm. And even as I was there, the gentleman, um, I just briefly met him as I was talking to the family and he slept the whole time, you know, and they're like, he's sleeping more. He's doing this. He's getting weaker. All of the telltale signs. Mm -hmm. So I had to be the bad guy. And, but the one blessing is that one of their very good family friends is a guy that had just recently gone through the death of his father using us as his agency mm. and he had said talk to the girls because they helped me they helped me with hospice Aww. and you know they'll walk you through it yeah. and so having somebody so close to them that had known us mm -hmm. gave them even more 
reason to really consider what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I later reached out to them actually this morning and said, Hey, um, this is what's going on with the schedule. I wish you well at your, your dad's doctor's appointment today. Mm -hmm. And so I hope they have opted to go to hospice. There are six kids, six different opinions. (laughs) I think that they all really, it was a very loving family. Mm -hmm. I think that they'll all get on the same boat sure. really soon because there, there's no there's no harm in it all it does is it there's added benefit and if you know if there's a turnaround in the condition and and mm-hmm. someone that you know six months down the road their circumstances have changed then they just go off of hospice well, but if it you know why not use the benefit of it that and if hospice doesn't think they're appropriate they won't take them yep so there's there, it's a win-win yeah but to educate yourself is so huge yeah sometimes we in healthcare aren't the best at um, giving great information and, and, and that does a disservice to the family. Well, and I think that um, also we get, it gets very compartmentalized, right? So people, exactly. this is my specialty. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to you about hospice because my specialty is not hospice mm-hmm. where we're like, we're just, we're going to talk at you about all kinds <laughs> of things. And you know, you pick from it what you think is going to work for your family. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think that can can be a problem to yeah. a degree. You're right. And, and the one, when this gentleman, his particular situation was the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that the kidney guy wants to say, Hey, you know, unless he's, he's, uh, you know, sometimes they just don't like to bring up the ugly stuff and, and somebody's, somebody's got to be a bad guy and and talk about it. And the other thing is that, um, I mean, one thing about hospice is once a person goes on to hospice, tell me if I'm correct in saying this, there's no more treatment options, right? Mm -hmm. So, so maybe the kidney guy that's that's treating with certain things is like, well, if they go on hospice, then they're not going to, I'm not going to be serving them anymore. And, and also doctors, isn't their primary job to save lives? So yes. they, that's what they're supposed to do. They're yes. supposed to keep people alive. Exactly right. <laughs> that's uh, interesting. I really had to think about that when I first had heard that mm-hmm. because, well, duh. you've yeah. got somebody that has just been in a horrific accident of any sort um, it doesn't matter about what quality of life is going to end up being because I did my job. I saved him. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's rough. That's, ooh, that's a rough one. Yep. Um, so morphine does cause sedation. You know, we're going to, it's just what does happen. Um, but uh, when used properly, it doesn't depress the patient's respiration. And those with, that are struggling with shortness of breath, it can um, bring significant comfort. Mm. Since opiates affect the part of the brain that deal with emotions such as fear and anxiety, it can also help dying patients relax, which brings additional comfort from disease-related changing in breathing. Mm-hmm. That's huge because breathing is a big deal mm-hmm. <laughs> as you're declining. And if you don't feel like you're getting enough oxygen, it's scary. Uh, it's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some coming care- caregivers believe that they have caused a loved one's death when the death occurs shortly after raising the dose. Um, did I use too much in the dropper? Mm-hmm. You know, all of the things. And so you have got to give yourself a pass on this. Yes. Be graceful to yourself. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they talk about uh, there are some health professionals that also do think that mor- morphine um, hastens the death process. So there's a gray area out there. You just have to figure out in your life what your belief pattern is mm-hmm. and, and, and go from there. Um, so it is used routinely. It's important to remember that opioid medications can feel morally charged and trigger intense emotions in caregivers, especially those responsible for giving it, but it's, it's normal for the professional staff. So Mm -hmm. you may think that somebody is taking it lightly. They, they aren't, they're just more used to it than what you're going (laughs) through. It makes me think of our electronic visit verification thing (laughs) where I'm talking to the professionals at our scheduling programs and they're kind of like dismissing me like, lady, calm down. It's not a big deal. And I'm Mm -hmm. all super wound up about it. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, but you have to understand, I don't work with this every single day. Right. So for the, for the family member that now is having to administer morphine, it is a big deal to them right? To the professionals that see this every single day, they're like, it's, it's all right. It's fine. It's going to be fine. So there's kind of that, uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect. So, and what you're saying is exactly the perfect kind of example Mm -hmm. because it's time sensitive. 
so is this. Yes. And so you're knowing, well, by March 1st or whatever the date, <laughs> I have to have X going. Right. And, and this is what these people are thinking too. Yes. And so I totally appreciate what you just said there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all it takes is just a little bit of conversation and communication to explain what's going on. And then, um, you know, the professional people need to not forget that they're dealing with people that don't, they don't see it every day. They don't deal with it. So slow down, take a little bit of time, explain things. And then I think that just takes a lot of the anxiety out of it. Oh, it's, it's really, really so emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. Um, they did ask one doctor, um, asked if he would, what he would say to someone worried that they are going to hasten a loved one's death. It, Basically, caregiving for someone at the end of life is incredibly difficult. It's very natural to second guess every step along the way. And in some ways, that storytelling to ourselves can be part of the grieving process. But we may say confidently that the morphine or any other med um, opioid medication did not hasten death. There um, are the several studies looking at the use of the symptom management medications at the end of life. I like how you say that mm -hmm. symptom, symptom management, management. Yep. that's a little softer mm -hmm. <laughs> and they found no effects on how uh, long someone lived and um, that was even true for the few patients who required much more dosage than average in order to remain comfortable mm. it's normal to question the impact of our actions but caregivers need not worry um that they use the morphine yes. when when used appropriately mm -hmm. well it's okay. and i and i laugh because have you ever had somebody that you heard that they, your dosage was this because your tolerance was this, <laughs> zero, and they, in your mind, they had the same medication, but they took enough that you're just like, geez, that would have knocked out an elephant, you know, <laughs> yes. and that's the same with this medication. Everybody's tolerance is, is different. So you've yeah. got to find that to find line. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's, don't that's, be afraid. Ask questions. It's okay. Use it as yourself. a tool for symptom management and oh, comfort control. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's tough. It's tough. We've seen all sides yes. of it. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, mother actually sent in this week's, uh, kind of grandma saying, mm -hmm. so, um, in this Montana woman magazine, mm -hmm. there was a teacher that said, it's important to know about weeds in our fields, weeds in ourselves and weeds in our country and try and fight against all of those. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, Cheryl. Yeah. Pull the weeds, man. <laughs> Get rid of them. That is a very good one, Cheryl. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes. If you have not yet subscribed, please do that anywhere you listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. Apple, Google, Spotify. Um, go like our Apaga Care and Share Facebook page, group page, and email. Yep. Just like Cheryl did. Yep. You can send that to Julie at ApagaHomeCare.com or Inga at ApagaHomeCare.com. Yes. Peace out, Girl Scouts. Have a good day. The caregiven name is a registered trademark of the Veritrust Health Incorporated Company. EPAGA is not connected to, affiliated with, or endorsed by Veritrust or any of its affiliates.